Kia ora koutou, and thank you very much for that introduction. So, there's a pointer here somewhere. There we go. So I'm going to talk about what we mean by swimmable and try to set the scene for the people who follow on from me. And thank you very much to the Southern Environmental Trust for this opportunity to come and speak to you all tonight. So a little bit about what, what rivers mean to me. Um, th this photo on the, the top left there is me swimming the Tuki Tuki River uh, last summer. So that's the river that I learnt to swim in as a five-year-old. And as kids in the summertime, my mum used to load us up into the car after school and we'd all go down to the river and have a swim. And I can still remember the first five strokes I took after a swimming lesson from mum when I was a five-year-old and seeing how far I'd got down the river. And so it's one of the great illusions of rivers is they make you think you're better than you really are. And so rivers have been carrying me along ever since. I spent a lot of time as a kid fishing and, and just uh, exploring rivers and then get, went on to diving and various things. So I really wanted to be something to do with rivers, but they hadn't really invented being a river ecologist when I was at school. But fortunately, I kind of fell into it. So for the last 30 years, I've been living up in Hamilton. So the river that I swim in most regularly now is, is the Waikato, shown on the bottom there. So this is Wellington Street Beach, just down the road from me. I also have a little place over at Whangamata, and I love to swim there with the, the people in the, in the picture there are my son and two of my grandchildren. And then up, one of the things I always do when I'm over there is walk up into the hills and swim in some of the cold hill streams of the Coromandels. So for, I think for me, is for, for a lot of New Zealanders, swimming is one of the ways we really interact with our fresh waters. It becomes very much a part of our relationship with the land and with the water. And it's a big part of being a New Zealander. So swimming, getting swimming right is really important for New Zealanders, as we have seen. There's other sorts of contact people have with rivers, which isn't swimming, which is also important. And just sort of wanted to mention that briefly. For Māori, interaction with rivers around the whole mahinga kai, uh, um, harvesting of kai, and ceremonies and things that have been really important for them, particularly Māori that had, had been disenfranchised from their land. So Tipani O'Regan described fresh waters as the, as the hinge of cultural heritage for Māori. And for many Māori, being able to carry on relating to water has been the way that they've been able to continue their culture and keep it going while they, they have been you know, alienated from their land. For me, angling was a big thing as well, and for, I know a lot of other people that's important, so that kind of more involves wading in the rivers. And then there's all sorts of things to do with being in, in boats, kayaks and waka armour, rafting and rowing. And sometimes, like these students in the, in the water of Leith and the Dine in Dunedin there, people do that at very high flows when other swimmers would be kind of out of the water. So that kind of creates issue as well for trying to maintain good microbial health over a range of different states of flow. So just generally what I'm going to cover of, of this is the, the broad range of things that are important to us for influencing swimmability. So you know, the first ones are, is there enough water there? Is it deep enough? The second things are around the aesthetics and the physical safety of the site. And that kind of comes down to, is the water clear? Is, it, is, does, is the bottom nice and, and a clear, clean bed? Uh, are there, is there too much algae or rooted plants present in the, to make it safe to swim or just a pleasant experience or not be really smelly? And then there's the things that people have been focusing on, particularly in the debate of late, which are the things that make you sick. There's the pathogens, a whole range of, of um, protozoans and bacteria and the like that we use E. coli as an indicator of those. And then there's the toxic cyanobacteria. So what I'll do is I'll just kind of outline for each of these what the issues are with them, what are the ways we can measure things, how we influence them, and how people manage. So first of all, this, this whole thing about physical size. The, the NPS for F, FM here, so this is a national policy statement for freshwater management. It's part of the RMA. Uh, there have been some changes made, actually just they came in last month to this, in the follow-up to what um, we were just hearing about earlier. That, uh, so that, that targets uh, having bigger rivers, so that's fourth order and greater rivers, uh, that are typically more than about 0.4 of a metre deep swimmable, and bigger lakes that are, have more than 1.5 kilometre perimeter. So what people mean when they say a fourth order stream, a fourth order stream is made when two third order streams here come together and make a fourth order stream. So we've got our smaller streams further up. But sometimes, like my favourite swimming spot over here, in the summertime up in the hills, that's a second order stream, but it's still 
makes a good swimming hole. And so if the council, if, if the regional council identified these other places where people bathe, that also they come into the regulations as well that people have been developing. So the things that affect the, the physicality, the physical suitability to swim, there are some natural influences about things like the stream order, the stream size, um, the climate variability. So, you know, over the last a few years, you've had a period of, of sort of lower recharge of groundwater. So that combined likely with a bit of um, irrigation, abstraction, has resulted in very low flows at Coes Ford. It's in the, the photo you can see here, as opposed to the more typical times, the photo below. So there's that, just that natural variability we have with climate. Uh, different sorts of rivers create different sorts of bathing habitats as well. So the, the Coromandel rivers, which have uh, steep catchments and they get intense cyclonic um, storms coming in, that creates big riffle pool systems. So you get nice pools and small streams. Whereas if you've got a spring-fed stream on, in, in Canterbury, they tend to just be big long runs. They don't have the same amount of pool. So the physical characteristics and setting also affects how physically suitable the swimming holes are. But then there's a whole bunch of human influences. So people take water out of rivers uh, for irrigation and for drinking, for hydro, uh, from both the surface waters or the groundwaters. We create storages on water, so we might put a dam on, so that changes the flow regime. We, if we uh, a forest, an area which has been a pasture, if we cut down trees, we change the evapotranspiration, the amount of water that gets taken out by the trees, and that affects the flow as well. And then there's climate change. So you probably can't see much of my graph down the bottom there, but what that is showing is the percent change in mean flow predicted for streams all around New Zealand um, in 2090 compared with 1990. And there's a whole lot of orange and yellow on the east coast of the North and South Island, which are areas where it's predicting that the flows will be reduced in a lot of places by between five and 20%, the mean flows and what they are now. And there are some places around Hawke's Bay, where I come from, where it'll be more than 20%. So there'll be quite big changes from climate change in the future. So what do we do about managing that? Well, well regional councils are tasked with setting minimum flows and maximum limits on takes through the rules in their regional plans and through resource consents. Most of those things are focused, though, on the ecological needs of species, particularly fish, not so much about recreation. Councils are also required to account for the quantity and quality of quantity of water throughout their catchments, so they're keeping track on who's taking what to, to meet these sorts of needs. So a second aspect is the aesthetics of the swimming experience. So what does the site look like? Is it attractive to swim in? Does it smell okay? Is the bed silty or not? And is there a lot of litter around? Um, and uh, one of the key things is the bed visible. So can I see if there are snags there? Can I see if there's someone's thrown a, a, a bottle in there and I'm going to cut my foot? Does it look safe in, to swim in? So the things that affect all those, there are a lot of natural influences. So some geologies and soil types just result in, in siltier rivers than others. So if you've got mudstone catchments um, with steep geology and, and, and a lot of erosion going on, you know, well, even without erosion processes, so these, the, the photo down the bottom here is of some mudstone on the North Island of New Zealand um, after Cyclone Bola, and you can see all those erosion scars that have occurred, but where there's, there's been pine trees, there's a forest there, there's no erosion in that area. So the interaction of the vegetation and the, the land use has a big impact. So just on an ordinary sort of day-to-day -day basis, has it, what's been the, the, how much rain we've had recently, that affects the swimmability, and how much floating algae we have. All those things can be um, natural influences, but on top of that, uh, the land use and land management impacts. So the, uh, the photos on the far side there are actually from the Waikakahi in South Canterbury. This was one of the poster boy streams for the Dirty Daring campaign that went on in the early 2000s. Uh, the photo taken there was when this had been used as a sacrifice paddock, as dairy farmers sometimes call them, during the winter time. Uh, but, you know, five years later, after a stream care group was developed in that catchment and they'd been applying, uh, fenced off the stream and planted it up, we can now see the bed. It's got a clean looking bed and, and the clarity's improved quite substantially. Uh, the other little example in the middle there is a stream I've been working on for a stream restoration project in the Waitau catchment over near Tauranga. Uh, the particular day we were there, there were some young cattle in the paddock next, that uh, drains through that little stream running into the main stem. Upstream, the water quality was about, the clarity is about three metres. Downstream, it was about 0.4 of a metre. 
So just animals and streams can have big impacts, local impacts on clarity. That stream also has been cleaned up in the last few years. They've fenced off, got the livestock out, and its water clarity has, has really gone up to the, similar to what it was in that other stream in the main stem. So these are things that can be managed with some sensible land, land management practices around streams, particularly with livestock exclusion. So the, the things that people do, reg, regional councils can set limits on discharges of fine sediment um, through rules and plans again. The, the RMA actually has a clause in it that all discharges have to meet, particularly focusing on point sources, that they don't cause conspicuous changes in colour and clarity. And there are some uh, MFE guidelines from way back in um, 1994 that d d describe what that means. And under development under the National Policy Statement for Freshwater Management, there's a thing in there called the National Objectives Framework, the NOF. You'll see a little bit of that this evening. So that sets out uh, bottom lines for water quality for, for uh, different places and rivers and different bands for grades from sort of excellent grades down to non unacceptable. There have been some grades that are currently being developed for uh, protecting ecological health for both suspended and deposited sediment. And presuming those things carry on with the new government, those are likely to provide quite good protection for aesthetics as well. So another aspect of, of swimmability is around the amount of vegetation, the sorts of plants you have and, and, and how, what effect they have on the swimming experience. You may not be see, able to see a lot of this stream on the, um, on the bottom left here. This is the Piaga River near Hamilton. Uh, it's, in this instance, it's completely choked up with macrophytes, with, with rooted plants. You can just see a few channels of water flowing through. You know, that would be quite a hazardous river to try to get in and have a swim. So with the rooted plants, they can actually, you know, with the tangling of your legs and things, that can be quite hazardous. <coughs> with the algae on the other side here, we've got different levels of, of attached algae to the riverbed that are uh, impacting on the, on the swimming experience. And that creates odours. So basically, streams that are chopper full of, of these plants are pretty unpleasant places to be swimming. So the things that affect those plants are listed here. There's, there's a whole bunch of natural influences about, about just the, the amount of shade you have across a stream um, and the, the flood regime, how frequently you have flow, it flows, floods through them. So rivers on the west coast of, of the South Island don't tend to have a lot of perifite and, or plants growing in them just because they have such frequent floods. On the east coast, where you get long periods of dry spells, you're much more likely to get these algal problems occurring. And then we've got the sort of drought cycles where these things really accumulate. Um, so there's influences on nutrients. So, so plants and rivers, like plants in your garden or on farms, they need light, they need water, and they've got plenty of water, but, um, and they need nutrients. So if, if we, as we increase the nutrient levels in our streams, we get more plants growing. Things that uh, uh, lots of, of algae need to, a stony bed to attach to, so that's another thing that influences their growth. And then the, the uh, silty, the, the rooted plants tend to like silty beds. Uh, so here's an example in terms of light with the period of shade. I've got a, a forest stream on the coral bed that's being harvested but leaving a, a good size of period buffer. There's hardly any old growth in the stream at all. It's close to another one which is, has no buffer at all. And, just take the root, it's full of algae in the bottom of that one. So the, there are things we can do around managing shade to control some of these things with just controlling the light environment. Um, if we have more water takes, we tend to uh, increase the propensity for um, algae to, to grow by having fewer flushing flows and less dilution for the input of nutrients that's coming into the river. Wastewater discharges obviously have effects, but we also have, in the South Island, uh, there's been, you know, the spread of Didymo through rivers of the South Island has been primarily, it's, been, it's an invasive species that's got in and it has, a, you know, a, a really interesting ecology in that it actually grows in quite low nutrient environments. But because of its physical structure, it's able to outcompete all the other algae and causes nasty blooms. So that a lot of the oxygen weeds as well are spread around by people on their boats and on their nets and on, on, on um, bits of boating equipment we might have take around. So those are the sorts of influences that affect those, those rooted plants. Some of them are things we can control through uh, setting rules on discharges and consents. Now in the National Policy Statement for Freshwater Management, 
It set out some bands and some bottom lines for the amount of perifitin, measured as chlorophyll A, is the amount of algal biomass, for, um, for acceptable and unacceptable levels in rivers. And there, there are sort of three bands that are acceptable and one that's not. And those are based on ecological values, but they also provide some protection for aesthetics. Now, when the NPS, when those bands first came out, it was sort of implicit that people would be would need to limit the nutrients in order to meet those bands. But this, the recent amendments that came out in, in September now require that regional councils develop nutrient criteria as well as uh, to, to, meet, to make sure that those bands are met, so, and both for controlling perifite and, and for limiting inputs to sensitive streams and estuaries further downstream. So those sorts of nutrient levels um, aren't applied nationally because the amount of algae growing in response to a certain amount of nutrient is affected by those other things we've talked about, about the flow regime, about the, the, the light climate and those sorts of things. But there is some generic na national advice is available as well in a, in a report that I was involved in. As far as the rooted plants, the macrophytes go, there aren't any NOF bands for swimming, but there have been some bands proposed for angling and they would also probably protect swimming. So there's some stuff coming through and there's been the, the some of the concerns are around control of perifite and have been addressed by the things that just came out in the last month. So moving on to the things that get the most airplay around swimmability is around the, the faecal pathogens. And there's a whole range of these, uh, viruses, bacteria and protozoa, all sorts of, and within them, a whole lot of different nasty organisms. The ones that tend to be the biggest uh, cause of illness for people swimming in rivers in New Zealand uh, is the Campylobacter, uh, shown in the middle there. And because there are so many different microbes that can make you sick, and sometimes they're there, sometimes they're not, they're quite expensive to analyse for, the way that we manage the risk from these is by measuring E. coli. So E. coli is um, an organism which is normally not toxic, although there can be some toxic forms, there's a VTEC, STEC version, but mostly they're non-toxic, but they are present in the, the guts of all warm-blooded animals. And so we look at the amount of that that's in the water to give us an indication of the risk of other faecal pathogens being present. So that's how things are measured. Um, the influences on those, there are some natural influences, if you call them natural, but some of these wildlife species are, um, have been introduced to New Zealand, but we have the birds as well. And we just get variations after a rainfall event even in bush environments, often you'll get reasonably high levels of microbes from the feral animals, faeces, material getting washed into the stream. But over uh, on the other side there of the human influences, there's, there's leachate from our septic and our sewage systems, from the, the discharges from dairy sheds and piggeries on, on, in the urban area. But a big one for New Zealand has been livestock access to streams and farm runoff. Uh, urban stormwater has a big impact, but it, it's not as pervasive as the, as the agricultural effects. The way that we try to manage this, and this is the latest stuff that's come out just in the last month, is by managing the levels of E. coli, as I mentioned before, and um, the levels that have been uh, developed have been developed from, from relationships between E. coli and Campylobacter, which is that main pathogen from the, the big New Zealand study that was done in 2002. So there are two different approaches to monitoring E. coli. One is surveillance, and that's sort of saying, well, is it safe to swim today? And uh, if you've got swimming sites then that have been listed in a plan, then regional councils need to monitor those every week. And the, the regional councils also monitor other, other sites uh, where people are swimming regularly during the summertime. So if, if they find that the E. coli level is greater than 260 per 100 mil, they have to do an investigation as to why, what are the likely sources of that. And if it's greater than 540, they have to inform the public. So that's around kind of that letting people know what it's like and there'll be, Tim and others will talk a bit more about this going further on. So the other side is the sort of the long-term grading of sites and this looks at uh, regular sampling, often monthly sampling throughout the year over a period of maybe five years and about 60 samples and looks at all that data and looks at a number of different measures of E. coli. What's the average, what's the median and how, how often are levels high? So. The, the grading that was being developed just recently by the, by the Ministry of the Environment, and this is the, the new, uh, new grading system in the National Policy State for Freshwater Management, has come up with this grading system here, which looks kind of complicated. 
because it is. And uh, so they've got four different measures of E. coli. The first one is, is what is the median. Uh, the first one is, is what proportion of samples are greater than 540 mils. So that's the level that you would, uh, a single sample for a, uh, a surveillance you would be telling people not to go into the water. And then you're looking at the percentage of sites that are greater than 260. And what is the median? So uh, if the median, all these ones have a median that are swimmable. So the swimmable level is, is, is being set at the boundary between the C and the D, between the yellow and the orange. So all of these are considered swimmable uh, with different levels of swimmable to go up. But if we look at the, for us, the, the average infection risk, if you go to a site that's just on the edge of this valley, not this acceptability, uh, so the, the greatest risk you can have is the swimmable level of 3%, likelihood of getting infected. But you, that's, actually, the likelihood of you getting sick is somewhat lower than that because people sometimes get infected but don't get sick. John. So just moving along then, um, the other area that, that people get sick from is from toxic cyanobacteria and that can be in, in, in the form of phytoplankton in the, in the water surface and often these things get blown onto the edge of lakes and these dark mats that can occur, occur in rivers and are particularly hazardous for dogs. There have been a lot of dog deaths in, in New Zealand over the last 10 years or so from these cyanobacteria and these are all influenced by um, highlight, same as the, as the algae, but cyanobacteria are particularly affected by warm temperatures. They have a competitive advantage over other sorts of algae when the temperatures get high. And in lakes that stratify, they have an advantage over other algae because they can move up and down through the water column. The things that can control them are very similar to, to those that affect other algae, but they, uh, with climate change, they are more likely to become more abundant because they do so well under high temperatures. So we manage those things by um, setting rules and plans and the, there are NOF bans in the, the new regulations for the, the phytoplankton and for controlling the nutrients that affect our, our cyanobacteria and also those other bans I mentioned before for dissolved nutrients. So just in summary then, swimmability in our fresh waters is, is, has got multiple things that influence it. Um, the management has changed just in the last month. Uh, there have been amendments to the National Policy Statement of Freshwater Management. This actually targets larger streams and lakes and it focuses on mi uh, microbial pathogens and cyanobacteria and periphyton. So some of those other things around habitat are not such a focus. So um, I'm hoping I've, I've sort of set a bit of the scene for the other people to speak about in a bit more detail and uh, thanks for listening. Cheers.